Meeting call to order. All members present except Ms. Gutierrez. There's no public comment hearing session. So we'll start off with our board workshop item. C1, building toward a common mission. Okay, so we'll move over to the table. Over. <laughs> If you, if you have a positive school district where everyone is really happy, you know, it's going to be easier to attract teachers. I would imagine one of the challenges here is recruitment. So it's going to make it easier to attract teachers, leaders, and things like that because you want it to be a school district. That's a little special. You have to give them a reason for coming here. Are we rewriting the existing mission and vision statements? You will. You're not doing that. That's not what this is about. But if you want to do that, as we go through it, that's your choice. But that's really not what this is about. Um, and, and we look at how the stakeholders perceive uh, Palo Verde Unified Mission. Are we authentic about the mission, or are we really just not living up to what we're saying in the vision statement? All right, next. So our deliverables, a sense of pur positive purpose and culture across the schools and community that attract you. students you don't really need to attract very good talent and resources, a commitment, consensus, and accountability on who we are and want to be, understanding how each individual behavior impacts our mission, because we're not like Apple Computer, as I've said before. We don't just make the product and it's really great and we'll tell everyone, you can't say anything about it until we release it. That's not how this works. Schools are so different. They're the inverse of this. You've got social media happening with parents and with teachers and with uh, all kinds of constituencies, and you can't control that. But if you can get everyone kind of in the same ecosystem, so to speak, you can control the overall feeling and so forth. It's never going to be perfect, but it's going to be something that's a little bit more organic. Um, a roadmap and touch points to evolve and maintain our concept of culture. That means that we're going to, after these exercises, we're going to start to dive down into when do our stakeholders come in touch with us, and how does that affect how we perceive us. And in the case of school districts and schools, they come in touch with us all the time, every day. And so it's a very, it's kind of complex, but once you understand it, it's not complex at all. You just begin to say that every little behavior that the teacher has, that the secretary has, that the facilities man has, whatever, really affects school districts. Um, and I really don't want to talk about facilities because it's something that comes up over and over and over again in doing these exercises is the quality of the facilities and how that affects people's perception of the school district. And then a framework from which to launch messaging and outreach. Hopefully we've come up with a, 
a narrative from which we can start to talk about the school district in communication ways um, more, more positively. Any questions? Okay, next. So there's three modules, connecting with our purpose, understanding a stakeholder experience, and our mission into action. And today, we're just gonna focus on the first one, articulating who we are and what makes us different and then visualizing who we are. And that's a fun exercise. That's the last one. We're gonna be using glue sticks and scissors uh, to cut pictures out. Uh, okay, the next one. And just clearly, who do you think has a great and clear mission-driven goal? Any examples from your mind? In general, or in any general, you can think of a school district. That's good. Well, but I was thinking of military. Military, and military. That's a very common one. Mm -hmm. I don't think the federal government does. Depends on how you find the mission. I think the medical industry. Mm -hmm. Depends on which sector. Medical yeah. industry, right? Yeah. 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 You can get heart surgery. Probably NASA. I think NASA must. Mm -hmm. If they're looking about going to the moon or going to Mars, that's a pretty clear mission. It is. You want military sort of oriented things that, that come up with missions. You know, it, it's they have a very clear sense of what they're doing and, and they get there. And they can control their labor forces to some extent. Um, and military controls the labor force very tightly telling them what to do. We don't have that luxury generally within the schools. So it, it becomes really it's a different world. I think those developing uh, the uh, uh, inoculations, what do they call it? The vaccines. Uh, the vaccines. Those certainly had a clear mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's lots of mission driven cultures. I mean, the, the, the um, Christian scientists are mission driven, the churches and religions. Scientologists are mission driven. Um, you can even guess that Harvard University and, uh, and those sorts of places are mission driven. If you talk about is the mission to educate or to raise more money or become influential, I don't know. But there's something direct happening there. Anyways, next please. So let's take a look at uh, Palo Verde. As I said, we're going to do the first module. Uh, next please. I'm going to first look at the worst case and best case for Palo Verde and the Unitarian School District. So we're going to divide them into two groups. You can be at this end of the table, you can be at this end of the table. And you can see right there on that, you guys can work with that. It says worst case. Under that, it says best case. There's a pad of paper over here for you two to work with. And for the next one, I'll show you some examples. So, example of worst case, oh, I spelled case wrong. Worst case. Uh, from another school organization was fully funded, wait, oh, this is best case, fully funded, waitlist, fully committed board, pick of litter hiring, unlimited resources, families feel supported, employees feel supported, very obvious things. The next one, which will be the worst case, is I said the best case. Underperforming schools, bankruptcy, current grievances, high turnovers, abusing children, failing students. This was a K-12 uh, organization that re represented about 20,000 students. So let's look at this next one. All right, we'll just, now we're divided into two groups. Hey, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to work together and think what's the best case for Palo Verde and what's the worst case? And if you're more comfortable, you can start with this. Here's the best case, here's the worst case. 
Is it worst case or best case? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it's worst case. Yeah. 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 This should be the best case. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the other one should be the worst. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, let me turn on the worst case. What we're trying to get to here is one just to break the ice and just say, it does. Yeah. But also to sort of understand, yeah. you didn't understand some of the challenges and some of the assets. What's specific to blood? Not me and his man, because it's a man. He said, is there anything in the past that has had it?
All right, guys. Let's stop for a second. All right. Let's let's report out what we have and, and what we picked. Why don't you all start? Since you're the finish first. Uh, we started. I started the fourth case. You want to hold it up so that so, the people in the back. So our number one was declining enrollment, and, and that's that's a factor here, right? Right. Right. It is. And so, and actually, we were just talking, and it really pretty much everything came roll into that that can control the whole whole pot. 
Um, so then, you know, we went ahead and sent to vacant funding, which obviously that controls that. Unhappy staff, again, that affects that. Um, relationships with stakeholders, low student achievement, decline in facilities, high dropout rates, and low demand in enrollment. Those were our worst case. So the worst case we had was underperforming schools, failing students, abusing children, uncaring staff, crime in schools with both staff and students, deteriorating school plan, and underfunding. Great. Do you think any of those things are happening today? I didn't hear that. Did you think any of these things are happening today? Aside from yeah. declining in the home. Yeah. What would you say? We have some <laughs> failing students. We do. Yeah. So if the students are failing, then our schools are underperforming. So. Generally speaking, we have a very staff. Right? Yeah. But it's not the best case. Okay. okay. So best case would be increased funding, um, high graduation rates, pride in their schools, um, a desire to attend and learn while in school, uh, high functioning administration, high community involvement, staff being fully vested in kids, uh, new facilities, and high quality career readiness. You feel those things are here today, or? I think it's, oh, a lot of them, at some level, mm -hmm. I mean, at some level, yeah, and it seems like everybody's continually working towards that. That's good. Just to keep long-term goals. All the way in this process, we're going to, we look at worst case and we look at the negative stuff, but ultimately we focus more on the, the, the positive, because that's where we're going. Right? Where we're headed, right. Right. Not where we've been. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we put down for the first best cases, fully funded, hiring top staff, 95% less attendance, above average test scores, meeting the needs of families, and ample equipment and supplies. Great. Any feedback from the crowd? That sounds pretty comprehensive. Mm -hmm. We shared our pins. <laughs> <laughs> That's what did it. <laughs> okay, the next slide is we're going to ask you to do a work statement about how Palo Verde is different. So I have these forms. This is an individual exercise that you just do by yourself. You have your head next to you. And I will show you an example of what this is. Some people get it right away and others don't. Doesn't mean one thing or another. <laughs> so in an area or city that stress, you know, in this case, in a city that is remote or rural or has a percentage of whatever the students are, wherever you choose to define this area, we want to see how you define the area. Only PDSD, what do you do uniquely? Well, you're the only school district, so that's a heads up. For who you do it for, how you define the community, and then by how you do it, by providing a quality education, by providing wraparound services, by providing after school programs, whatever you think that is in order to why you do it. You know, why do you think that they're doing what they do? If you go to the next slide, you'll see, okay, this is a KH organization in Los Angeles, uh, in a market full of schools and organizations that claim to support children and families. This organization, interestingly, was a mental health and social services organization that chose to open up schools. So you see they define themselves very differently. Only we intensely focus on strengthening the core foundational elements of family, school, and community, meaning mental health and social services. For populations who often lack access to opportunities that lead to success by providing high quality and coherent services and opportunities to children, families, and communities to address needs and promote success. This is how they define themselves. I noted for them, you do not have the word achievement in here at all. <laughs> so they are very, very focused on the mental health and social services that they delivered, and they were very good at that. Um, so that's an example. It's, it's a little different from what, who you are, but give it a try and see if you can fill it in. And I can ask any questions.
guitarist in that as well. Right. You know, kind of a pop. Right. Yeah, I just sat in a chair and let him walk through it. Okay. Is that Ivanhoe? Is it Ivanhoe? Yeah, right across from Eisenhower. They call it the Infusion Center. Okay. Let's let's stop and let's let's read them. So let's start with you. Sure. Trying to think of the end, so I just it's all right. it says in a city and region that is rural, only Cambridge High School District comes together for a family staff community that providing support and services needed in order to maintain compliance. Okay. In a city and region that is isolated and rural. Only PBUSD can provide comprehensive education, PK-12, for every student regardless of capabilities by assessing uh, to determine individual needs in order to develop functioning citizens. Okay. In a city and a region that is very geographically remote, only PBUSD works to educate the children of life, all the while building relationships and supporting the community for a population that does not have the options that are available in larger, less remote communities. By providing an administration and staff that genuinely cares about the children and the community in order to help the children of life see their potential and the opportunities available to them through education. I want to go a different route. Uh, uh, in a city and region that is isolated from other cities, 100 miles, our PBUSD celebrates homecoming with our community and our alumni for all who attended Calvary High School uh, by the district and by the community gatherings in order to increase pride in our school and our community. Mm -hmm. They hear a sense that there's no surprise that the school district plays a really big role in the community. Mm -hmm. it's a, it is the community base in terms of the city government and things like that, but they're not as extensively involved in people's lives other than the interaction of the school district. Geographically remote, those are. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. 100 miles from Anchorage. It is. Well, how do you get into that city? I mean, you know, you're the board. It impacts everything. It yes. impacts the services available. Um, it impacts, you know, our access to what the county offers, support the county offers. Um, it, it impacts the, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want to come here to work. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, you need a special therapists, you need those things. They have the ability to say, no, we're not coming to you. And they don't have to. So, so do you find yourself like paying a lot more money for the people? Mm -hmm. I don't I necessarily think so. I, I think we try to be competitive, but I don't think we're necessarily paying more. Um, I, I think, I, personally, I think when people move here and see it, it's a great community, right. you know, they're going to want them to stay. And, 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 and I know, for example, in the Coachella yeah. Valley, the three school districts, and Coachella Valley Unified is the lower performing school district mm -hmm. in the lower income area. So they do pay. Uh, you make more money if you work in Florida Unified than if you work in the other two school districts. Well, I think we're competitive with competitive countywide. I think above average. Uh, the biggest problem I think we have is like Danny said, we're isolated and things to do for the kids and the adults. That's the big issue with people that want to live here. Or if they do work for the district or with the president of the city, they commute. They commute. From MBO or someplace in Phoenix, uh, that's one of the big problems that the city is facing right now. You have people commuting from MBO to work here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Can you still live there? Well, no, well, we have, I know that a couple of years ago we had a teacher that lived over in Banning that was driving all the way out here. So yeah, we do have people that commute. I know that there was a teacher that lived out in Big River and it commuted here. Yeah, some of them have soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Okay. So they must like their job enough to right. enjoy working in the school district, but there's not a lot that the town offers the students to have all the amenities of a city. Right. But my experience is that these smaller school districts are so much more um, manageable and they're friendly. You know, people are, are much more of a community in a school district like this than you are in Riverside Unified or LA Unified or something like that. So it's, it's an advantage. It, it, it makes all the it's, it's, it's an advantage because you, you hear a lot of us call each other by first name and not by, you know, Mr. or Mrs. We, it, it, we tend to forget that, that we, we call each other by our first names or nicknames, whatever it is. But, but that's, that's just a small, small town. town. Small town. Small town. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, can you pass those over to me? I'm going to take them and I'll feed them back to you when I come back at the end of the month. And so, for the final exercise, I've left a lot of time is we're going to look at the, well, let's turn the slide to the next slide. We're going to look, oh, sorry, back. We're going to visualize Pelletier Unified now. So this is different as to this point, we've asked you to write you know, what you think of Pelletier, what your feedback from the grids, things, and so forth. This is going to be a little different. So I'm going to give you two grids, and on one of the grids right today, and then on the other one, right five years from today. Oh, there's four. You got two of them. It's right today in the corner. And five years from today. And the same for you. And we'll look at the team again. And I'm going to give you a bunch of pictures. You're going to Figure out with all the grids you can see it says house, sport, animal, color, texture, chair, and instrument. Let me give you a piece of paper with pictures of all of these things. Here, for instance, are all of the houses. And you're going to choose a house that you think represents Pelletier Unified today, as well as where you'd like to see it five years from today. And then I'm going to ask you to write next to your selection why you chose that particular house, in this case, sport, animal. Whatever. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think so. I'll be here. Here's a bunch of houses. You have to start out. So today and five years from here. So what we're really looking at is very interesting motion. So which of these oh, represents Calabria yeah. so Unified? Where would you like to see it go? Which house represents well, I don't think we'll see it. No, we're not there. Not there. Uh, I think it's about two years. Oh, the three or five years. I sit down for five years. Oh, very good. Uh, so this is. And then right, <laughs> we can select one. Right down next to why you selected it because it's transparent, it's colorful, it's old, it's elaborate. Whatever reason. Well, whatever you select, just write the next to it. You know, I'm just left. Okay. So that's the important part here. You select it because it's pretty, or it's dilapidated, or here. It's an illogical moment. That's important. Yeah. 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 And do right next to them why you're, why you're selecting them. Okay. Um, 
Right, right next to them. Why are you taking them? Okay. Because that's what's going on right now. That's what's going on. Do you want to have one? Yeah, you can have one.
Yeah. Oh, it's just like math, you know, they don't understand it too. My grandson was in middle school and he started with uh, high school and freshman. And they were going, they said he needs an authentication for the reading of the table. Read like a lion. He said, well, they eventually memorized it, but if you read this in that book, today, he doesn't know what the book is. Who knew what it is? Because he didn't even remember it. Yeah, he didn't even remember it. This was just great teamwork. It was the eighth grade class. And that sometimes the old methods. They are. They are. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, of what they did. You can see that this they divided into teams in this case, and they called themselves in fact a corporation, Team Apple. Um, here they had under construction, up and downs. This is a school organization, old school, not. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this negative. Too much, all alone. It, a lot of common themes are silos. No matter what organization that we're working in, everyone thinks that they work in silos. Uh, isolated, that seems to be it. And with teachers particularly, you see that, of course, because they're in classrooms. And depending on the school district, often you're in a classroom by yourself for long periods of time. So it's not surprised that they have that. Next one. So here I took the pictures away. We just put some of the words so you could see what they said in this case. This was a district that really was not, not tremendously negative, still figuring it out. In fact, for grateful, lack of coordination, inconsistent, overwhelmed. I don't think those are really, I mean, they, they sound like dramatic statements, but they're actually fairly common statements, I think, out of, out of school districts. Because there's so, there's so much going on in you know, a school district today, and I'm sure it's the same here. Not only are you studying a year after pandemic, you're testing kids, you're contact tracing, you're quarantining, there's just a lot that goes on. The next one. Here we look at tomorrow. And one of the nice things about this exercise is that when people get to tomorrow, they really get very positive about where they would like to see the organization go. So here it's innovative. They picked a picture of uh, Disney Hall in Los Angeles. State of the heart, art, in teamwork, united, they're all working together, growing, there's in concert. Again, a lot of emphasis on them all working together. I think that's, that's a real challenge for, for some school districts just to get everyone on the same page across the district. And that's assuming that your district has the same demographic across the schools, and that is obviously not always the case. And we can with another district that is, you know, half in Corona and half in Riverside, and they have a very different demographic in each of those communities that they have to serve. So sometimes we can all work together as a challenge. So the next one. Here's some of the nice words they use. United, teamwork, growing, vibrant, in concert, communal, attuned, connected. These are the kinds of things we're looking for. Because this is telling us where this organization really wants to go. And you can pretty much see what they're really asking for here. Is they're really looking for more cohesion, they're looking for leadership, they're looking for somebody to sort of take control of this whole system that they're involved in. So next, next, I'm going to show it. So ultimately, we put it together like this. We start to visit another organization, we took look at what you've done in a positive sense, and it's not just the board. We look at the faculty, we look at the parents, we look at the students even. We look at we're going to ASD class and ask them what they think of the school because we want everyone to match up as much as possible authentically. Obviously, one group, the teachers, thinks that this is just a fabulously you know, well-functioning school district. And the students aren't so sure. We want to know that. And I don't think that's going to be the case here. So here we're looking at all the positive things, and that's what we're going to focus on. Next. And we get to a point, and this was with uh, the social services agency, where we create these visuals after the exercise. And you can see it's very much focused on the, the positive aspects of it. And we feed this back. So if we have 75 teachers and they all give us this information from those, those exercises, we then feed back. He told us that the two key words, and we do word counts and everything that they do. And we start, to, we start to create rankings of the words that they use. And the words in this case were together. They wanted to work together and they wanted to achieve something. They wanted their kids and their families to achieve something. So we know our children and families can succeed. They often need deep, varied, and individually tailored educational, emotional, and social supports. We provide that. And you can see here, these are some of the other words. Teamwork, empowering, deep community excellence. that came out of the exercises with this particular organization. Now we don't, when we do this, I just, I take all the information and we present it back. And it's important in this process that, the, that you all, when we come back, I say, this is what you told me, and then you can say, well, yeah, that's right. Or you can say, no, that's not what I, what I really intended. And that's important. So this is just, it's something that we create and feed back. And then once we have an agreement on it, 
then we have a statement that we can all say is what we're about. Does that make sense? Next. And you can see that here they had, this tells a little bit about each of these pictures were our member of this process. So we, we literally got to the point where, and this was good, we had these pictures here, similar to these, but then they decided they didn't like the pictures. And then we went searching for actual new photographs for everything that they wanted to symbolize in this process. So here we have the hands coming together, the collaborative diversity was a big part of, of what this organization wanted to be, a teamwork, innovative, creative, um, all moving in the same direction, partnership for great strengths. So I think for the, for the same way there, next please. And this um, was probably a little bit more analogous. This was the K-12 organization. And you can see that achievement was really important to this organization. They were, they were thinking of pretty cool from that angle. And so we know students can do more. The belief in the students was, was critical to everything that they did. We can do more for them than we have to act now. Urgency is important here. So to they want to inspire the kids and families that they work with and they want them to achieve. This is an organization that focused on test scores uh, to a large extent. So that we raise the bar and expectation for everyone in order to help each individual child be the best student and the best person that they can be. We engage parents and communities. I'll mention this organization had a massive parent engagement program on which they spent millions of dollars. And they would get all of their parents on Saturdays to come to these, what they call the parent college. And it became their way of providing community, their way of engaging their parents. They also had a very big um, a Latino parent population. And a lot of the Latino parents they figured out they came from areas where they didn't really know how to do it in the classroom. They didn't know they had a right to go into a classroom, into a school. They didn't know what to look for in a classroom and so forth. So this parent college told them all about these things. If you get the parents engaged in kids' education, generally their kids are going to do, perform better in school. And so that was the model for this particular organization. So we knocked on the door, acquired the sense of accomplishment reverberate. So that's what this was next. Quick question. Yeah. How, how does, uh, I guess really, it would seem like COVID needs to play into this. It will. Mm -hmm. Okay. But because it really, all of these things are broad, but safety and health and well being, and that would seem like that would. It does. Okay. It does. So I mean, currently, I mean, it, hopefully, not eventually, but right now, that's kind of the forefront of. The community needs to know that we're. So I would bet if we did faculty and, and the leadership, we would get a lot of feedback around parents involved, our touch with parents, involving our community. Involved, and this is very pandemic related because the last year has required school personnel to be much more engaged in community activities, whether you're handing out food on a daily basis, whatever you're doing. So that's absolutely correct. There's a big overhang, and I'm seeing that where achievement doesn't come up. Uh, as, as, as a goal as much because of this, this, this sense of community. So do factor that in uh, when, we, when we do this. So let's go to the next one. And that's up. That's it. This module. That's the three exercises. Any questions? Do you have an innovator thing? We have so many, so many families that are just um, you know, with the pandemic and with the economic conditions and so forth, many families are just hanging on and, and the one stable thing in the community, and, and it's been unstable for the last year and a half, uh, is are the schools. And they can always count that when they send their student to school in the morning, your child in the morning, they're gonna go and they're gonna get fed and they're gonna get educated and they're gonna be brought home safely transported to school safely and um, uh, our our community as many communities are are just hanging on by a thread mm -hmm. you know, with the conditions as they are now and, uh, yes, I mean, and we're lucky to be able to provide an institution that um, that, that takes care of those needs um, and I know it's been said that uh, the uh, 
school mules are the one stable thing that, that uh, they can count on. And not every family has that capability. It's going to dig your, I mean, it's, 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 I don't know, Tracy, you can pitch in. It seems like, you know, the schools have been asked to do all kinds of things now that they're just, they weren't initially intended to do. Um, you know, I, I don't know how schools are currently functioning with the contact. If you take a large school district and you're testing them all and you're quarantining and you're contact tracing and you have to pull in subs all the time and all of this stuff and you have to teach school and you have to, you know, you have to deal with new regulations that have come down from the state that you can carry and things like that. How do you run a school and how do you help the kids when you're doing all of those things? And to me, when I was going to school, a lot of it was uh, socializing with my friends, mm -hmm. being around people, uh, interacting with teachers and other students, and participating in the basketball team, um, you know, the car club or whatever, but with other people. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that for the last year, year and a half. And that's... And we're dealing with that on top of it, too. It's, you know, the last big year and a half of socialization, and now yeah. we're having to learn to get back to minding the manners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you're yeah. just hanging by a thread. Yeah, it's, 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 it is tough, and it does come with you, but it's not, you can see this is qualitative research. And what we're asking you to do is, in a linear way, tell us what the school district is about, and then push you in a visual way to tell us how you pursue the district, which is a different way of thinking about it. And when you do it with larger groups of people, you get massive manipulation and you can hold together and extrapolate. And hopefully we'll do that here when we start to go through the district. And we'll report back to the board as we as we do that so you get a sense of, of what people are saying and, and and how much it tracks with what you perceive is happening in the school district as well. But the intent is to come up with a very positive, you can see these statements, very positive statements, very positive workflow plans that people can adhere to. And the next step is to really start to break it down. And so we know we'll come up with a positive statement about what we want to be as a rural school district, attentive to kids and so forth. But the next step is to say, okay, we want to be these things. We, we, and we are these things to a large extent, but how do we become those things given what we are? So you know, our product is food, it's people. And we're very organic. You come into a school, people are making impressions of the school from the moment they start to think about sending a child there. As you know, whether it's through their friends, whether it's through Facebook and social media, and one of the most important things is when they first walk into a school. How do they visually, what do they see? How are they greeted? You know, all of these little things, we're gonna break all of that down uh, so that everyone understands what their role is in putting forth this, this positive culture and mission. And hopefully everyone will want to do that. This is not meant to be, you know, something that's, that's forced on people. This is something that we're hopefully, you're giving us the information, we're just giving you back what you've said, and hopefully we can help you get there. So that's really the intent. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, our teacher did you an A. You have our teachers here? It's still cut and blue, right? Yes, we can. So thank you, and this, is, this should be a fun process for us. And, and the hope, the one of the hopes is to really, you know, get everyone in the schools, sort of refresh, it's like a reset. You know, push you all together in a room, get you talking about these things in different ways, and then hopefully come out of this with a real set of, of messages and common, common purpose that we can all buy into. And it's, and it's something that's ongoing. It's not that we reach a point, and, okay, there, we're done, uh, no. That's obviously not how this works. It's, it's much more, much more uh, ongoing, and you understand this. I mean, the schools, as I said last time, are, are you know much more akin to Disneyland than they are to IBM or or to Xerox like that. Meaning that you know I buy the phone, I just get the phone, and I make my impressions of Apple. But when I go to a school and do a school district, I'm making impressions all the time. Like you are at Disneyland. It's what's you know Snow White Kermit, you know that kind of thing. That's the same thing. Was that reception friendly to me? Was that teacher knowledgeable, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. So we'll go over all of that and, and start to break it down. And hopefully we'll be doing it throughout the district when we get there. Okay.
thank you for your time. We appreciate you coming out here. Of course. Perfect. I'm going to take all this with me. And then I'm going to come back on the 28th. Okay. And I'm going to present you what you said to me.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Jocelyn from Calvary High School, a senior clerk. 
being recognized for everything, teamwork, kindness, respect, integrity, service, excellence, innovation, relationships, and inclusion. We also have Rachel Angel, the principal of Pelerini High School, being recognized for excellence and innovation. We also have Laura Rodriguez from Ruth Brown. She is being recognized for teamwork, kindness, respect, equity, service, excellence, and innovation. We also have Carol Wade from Appleby, with the, uh, Appleby Teacher, being recognized for kindness, respect, equity, and service. We also have Jennifer Schreiner being recognized. She's our risk management coordinator. Jennifer is being recognized for teamwork, respect, and service. We also have Alex Saboto, our technology director, being recognized. He's being recognized for teamwork, equity, service, and inclusion. We're also recognizing Jesse Gutierrez. Jesse is our, our nutritional service supervisor. Jesse is being recognized for teamwork, kindness, equity, service, innovation, and inclusion. We also have Janine McBride being recognized in, here at our district office. Janine is being recognized for teamwork and service. Also being recognized, this person wrote a whole bunch of names. So on this one, we have Daryl Pitts, Romero Mendez, Jr. and Senior, Jerry Rios, Danny Rodriguez, Jose Flores, and Marcos Perez. These guys are being recognized for teamwork, respect, service, and excellence. And it says these guys always go the extra mile. So I'm super happy to recognize these people. I know our district has been working extremely hard. It's been a tough start, but we're working hard to make sure these kids are in school doing great. Um, I do want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank all these people for working so hard. And I want to thank everybody that submitted one of these. Thank you. Our next presentation is the Unknowledge Act Schools. I was waiting to like load the, I guess the audio or something. parent communicate the end of year uh, revenues and expenditures up against prior years, uh, looking at contributions to restricted programs, also looking at some of the carryover, and then reviewing the financial data from some of our outlying funds, which are 15 and 21. The audit actual um, report is pretty straightforward. It's, it's what really happened, so it's, there's no you know, projections or guesses ideally in this. Um, and so we're starting with our LCFF revenue sources. Um, and these do not include the in lieu taxes that we send to the charter schools, um, but relatively speaking, we're down a little bit in LCFF revenue from the year before, but pretty steady though all in all, we're about $32 million. And then uh, we have about 2 million in in lieu taxes that we send to the charter school and to our COE, um, which brings our net LCFF uh, entitlement down to about $30 million. Um, the federal revenues, um, we had a significant increase this year in federal revenues. If we go straight down to the bottom, you'll see in prior years, we had like 3.1, 3.5, almost 3.6 million. And then last year, uh, we're reporting 6.8, almost $6.9 million, which uh, represents like 144% increase in our uh, federal revenues. A lot of that obviously is due to the uh, CARES and ESSER funding like that, uh, so we're being propped up during the COVID pandemic. Um, that is probably the biggest uh, impact that we had to federal funds. And then, again, all in all, uh, 
Uh, last year we had about 3.5, almost 3.6 million. This year, 6.873. Uh, state revenues um, up about 50% over a prior year. Uh, we had the, the, so we've had the bus grant for the last couple fiscal years, kind of off and on the books. But this is the year that it actually we actually received the buses this past year, past school year. So we recorded that revenue and those expenditures. Um, that was about six hundred thousand uh, dollars additional that we didn't get in years prior. Um, other than that, the uh, um, state revenues are pretty stable. Um, that was all. The, the local revenues we have quite a bit uh, increase here. Um, I would have to dig. Oh, the Selva transfer. Um, we. We recorded um, some revenues from scale from that actually belong to scale, and we pushed out to them. That's that that's a biggie there. That 1.5 million is kind of new. Um, that's just giving them their entitlements. Uh, and then I'm gonna have to dig into the local revenue to see specifically if you, why the the large increase there. Um, but that's a pretty big increase over prior year as well, 456. For expenditures and, and transfers out. Um, Reasonably stable, you know, considering that we had a COVID year last year, uh, we spent almost right on the 39 million, right on the money, 38.999. And then this year we nudged over just over 39 million. Uh, you'll notice that we had some salary reductions in teachers. This past year, uh, we had reduced our teaching ranks by about nine teachers. We've since added them back, um, but that's a little bit reflective of that. We increased our books and supplies. A lot of it is just extra COVID stuff. Our capital outlay went up significantly. Again, that's the buses. Um, we've employed the LTE network. Uh, what else was kind of big this year? We, we had a few things in capital outlay uh, that were bigger than what we uh, purchased in years past. If I'm not mistaken, I think we bought a tractor at the beginning of the year that's feeding into that number as well. Um, but all in all, the total expenditures are relatively stable, like I said, with a little bit of an uptick. Um, our contributions. Um, all in all are, are declining. Uh, last year we were at 5.62, or excuse me, 5.26 in contributions to uh, restricted programs. Um, we ended the year, this year, at about 4.4 million. We had some pressure taken off transportation uh, compared to previous years. Um, that's because we were able to repurpose some of those employees to do other things, and then we covered those um, expenses with some of the air, uh, the ESSER and CARES funding. So if, if we've had a little bit of reprieve on uh, some of our contributions this year, same with special ed, uh, the routine restricted maintenance went up a little bit. We had trouble recruiting in JROTC, so that's down to zero this past year, where it had been previously about 160,000 or so in years prior. Um, but uh, I do expect the contributions to uptick in the next one or two fiscal years as all of the scaffolds start to get removed from us uh, that are related to CARES. With respect to the fund balance, um, it grew rather significantly this year. Uh, in prior years, we were at seven and a half, just over eight million. Um, this past year, the, the fund balance is actually, let me back up, it was to the middle there where it says ending fund balance. It's actually 9.3 million, 9.9 .9 in the previous two years. This year, it's shot up to almost 16 million. Um, of that 16 million, 2.8 are restricted balances, and then the uh, the 12.9 would be uh, it's in the unassigned, but we would call that committed or assigned balances. Um, so pretty healthy, all in all, uh, as we sit today. But as I've stated numerous times, you know we have facility needs that are unmet. There are still negotiations to be had. Um, just a lot of projects that could quickly erode that down, but it's not a bad place to end. And ultimately, if you have determined to write a one-time fund, yes. it's going to be used for anything other than projects. Right. If there is, if there is. And we swap, so that's the thing, we swap some things out, but as I stated a few slides ago, when the state or or federal government starts pulling away some of the scaffolds that they, that they you know, used to prop us up, that can get eroded quickly. You know, as I've, I've stated before, one month of payroll is right about or under $2 million. So it's, you know, 
12, 12 or 13 million sounds like a lot, but in reality, it, it goes fast. Um, and particularly in my case, I think, you know, when we think about dealing with some of the facility needs that we have, it will go really fast. Uh, these are the outer funds. Cafeteria is doing pretty healthy. Um, this year, uh, their revenues were about 3.8 million. That's for both uh, programs, both the 5310 and 5320, the child care. And, um, you know, I just credit uh, Jesse for, you know, working together and being creative in terms of how, you know, to maximize opportunity in an otherwise you know, dreadful year. Um, you know, we did the bulk feeding, you know, we just got creative with a few things and we went out to the kids' households and you know, dropped food off and, and kept the program functioning. And um, all in all, it, it, it did well for us. Um, so the, I think the fund balance he's sitting on down there is, is just at about $2.3 million. I think he has about a million in each one, a little over a million in each one. Now the interesting thing we have to keep an eye on with this is that you're not allowed to carry more than three months worth of operating costs. So that's why he's he's you know big on trying to get these projects implemented around here so that we can uh, spend down some of that reserve and um, not have to send anything back. Ideally, we'll be able to use all of those dollars to benefit the uh, district uh, instead of returning the funds. And so like right now, they're working on the cafeteria at the high school installing the speed line they're working on the floor it's kind of taped up right now but uh we should have that i think done within the next uh, few weeks here and so we'll just keep on you know keep on keeping on with the, the nutrition services project so that we can spend that down to a current compliance uh fund 21 this is our bond um we ended the uh, june 30 2021 with about 4.4 Four nine, almost four and a half million uh, left in the bond account. Um, <coughs> we still have. There might have been a. Re I think there's a retention invoice that's not included in there. We still have some payables from the barn. I want to say site security is pretty much closed out, but uh, we don't expect too much more to be going off from existing projects. Um, so most, of, bless you, most of that uh, balance should should hold. And then. Fund 25 is Capital Facilities Fund. Um, this is where we collect our developer fees and we kind of just usually hold on to this money until um, we identify a need and it's normally related to growth. We collect the developer fees uh, in anticipation of um, that activity creating growth in the city, in the community. So it could mean that more kids are gonna come to school. It may mean that we need another, you know, classroom down the road or something like that. And so these funds could be used to offset uh, some of the new costs that are associated with growing. But like I said, we don't we don't have a lot of developer fees. Uh, this year we took in $13,700 worth of developer fees. So that's not a lot of project. So at this point, there's no reason for us to start looking at you know spending this money just yet uh, until we can start to be impacted by the building and activity out there. Is there any fund balance that especially a debt from white? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, that's 90%. No, I, just, I thought we um, had 100 in a I wish. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a decimal for sure. So it's about 180, almost 181,000 sitting in there uh, until needed. Fund 35, this is the one that I, I think I came to you a couple meetings ago and told you that we received an invoice for like the $700,000. So if, if I'm not if I understand this correctly, this is this is the fund where we record. I ha I personally haven't had to use this in my tenure, but uh, it's for new facility construction. If we engage in modernization activities, this will be the fund where we track all of that activity. And it's also the fund where you record uh, your financials for hardship funding. And what I stated to you a while back is that when we built Appleby, we used Fund 35. And when the project was over, I'm assuming there was still, you know, several hundred thousand dollars left over that we, in theory, should have returned back to the state. We didn't do that. We used it for other purposes. The state has sent someone calling, and they're telling us we owe them about five hundred and thirty or forty thousand dollars. That will come out of that thirteen or you know, million or whatever that we saw in the previous slide. So, and as I've stated in the previous board meeting, they give us three years to either find a eligible hardship activity to spend that money on 
And if you can't do that within the course of three years, then we will have to send back the 500 and some odd thousand plus interest. So this is one to keep an eye on. We have the money sitting in reserve. And at the end of the day, if we can't find, we were fortunate that they were willing to reset the clock on us. The clock had already expired and they wanted their money back. When I appealed it, uh, they found out that they had made a mistake, but they still wanted their money back, just not as much. But what they did do for us was they reset the clock for another three years. So if you know, we can find a way to leverage those dollars in the next three years, that would be great because you know, 500,000 for us is much better than having to send it back. So again, just some money to keep an eye on. Fund 40 um, is where we previously deposited our redevelopment revenue. I've, this is also where we used to service our debt from. Um, as since we have no debt anymore, as, 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 at least uh, on the books, on our, you know, our general fund, that's, that our general fund services, what I've started to do is I've depleted this fund. I have it down to $582, as you can see, in the uh, June 30 ending balance. And what I did is what I, I moved it all over to fund six, which is part of the general fund, and I use it to make the contribution to the routine restricted maintenance account. Um, there's not a lot of things you can do with this money, uh, so, you know, aside from servicing debt, that would be the next best thing. And, and in doing so, it takes pressure off uh, the general fund. So that's why it's so low. Um, and I will continue to probably deplete it, you know, as, uh, as we're receiving it. Because we get about, as you see there, about 500 grand a year. It's anywhere from 400 to $500,000 a year for this. And our contribution to maintenance is over a million. So this is just a piece of it. So every every year I'll I'll probably empty this out, use the money to make the maintenance contribution, and then that eases the, the burden of the general fund. Uh, this is just a bond fund. This is our old bond fund, like from probably before any of us were here. Well, I don't even touch this. The county services it. Um, I'm not even. I don't even think I'm allowed to touch it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, there's still 2.7 uh, uh, million sitting in there. And again, the sole purpose of this fund is just to service the debt on old uh, bonds that we have. The other thing I want to highlight is the form CEA. Um, this is the uh, current expense of education. I believe it's called like a current education expense or something. But anyway, what it's essentially saying is that uh, classroom compensation has to be 55% of the, of the gross total expended budget and we were at 58.13. Uh, last year we were at 59.63, so we're a little down, but nevertheless above the 55. And this was, the maintenance of efforts were more difficult to meet this year because of the ESSER funding. It, it, you know, it just made it that much harder to do so. Um, but nevertheless, we're, we're there for 58.13. This is safely above 55%, so no concerns there. And then the carryover that we have for different programs are illustrated here. Title I has about 287,000 in carryover. The ESSA, the 3182, that's the special grant that we received for Twin Palms and Ruth Brown, the CSI grant as we also know it. They have about 605,000 in carryover that needs to get spent, at least the bulk of that, by the end of September. That's on our radar, we're watching it. Uh, ESSER, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, GEAR, those three, the 3210, 3212, and 3215 are all COVID related funds. We have about 735,000 left in uh, ESSER 1. Um, just about four and a half million left in ESSER 2. And 127,000 or so in the GEAR funding. Uh, and then moving down to 3311, 3345, those are spe special education resources. They're small resources. 3311 is for the private school, which we don't even have, um, which is why there's a little bit of carry over there. And then 3345 has something to do with professional development. And we just need to make a, uh, a deliberate effort to provide training toward, I think it's the infant program or the preschool program. And the award is literally only like $119. So it's hard kind of to find what to do with that, and it has to be spent on training. Uh, Title II has about 100, and just over 100,000 uh, in carryover. Title V has about 83,000, almost 84 in carryover. Title, is that Title IV, uh, 75, almost 76,000 in carryover. The Title III immigrant is kind of a small uh, allocation. There's about 1,065 left. We didn't even get any money in current year. Um, we didn't have any uh, immigrants that we were aware of this year. 
uh, at least newly arriving. Um, Title three EL has about 57,000 in carryover, Head Start 284. The Tufi grant has about 4,000, and then the in-person instruction has a little north of a million. So we have quite a bit of carryover to push through. Um, not all of it is expiring real soon. Um, there's some of this that can go out to 2022, um, but also important numbers to watch. The last thing you wanna do is return uh, any carryover funds. And that's the end of the report. By and large, like I said, everything is moving along just fine. The balances are healthy. You know, um, I still, me playing, usually like to play conservative and, and you know, watch things carefully so that we can protect that. Um, but by and large, we're in okay shape. And back on that last plan. Sure. Um, now, got my attention when you said um, by the end of September. Okay, so that's going to be, 000. yeah, that's going to be 3182, and it's actually not the whole, the whole 685. What's, what that represents is two years worth of award. Well, let's see, I have a decent idea of the, of how much we have to spend of the twin, of the CSI funds. So I, I show total carryover of 605, but that is I would this guess year. about 300,000. Maybe just maybe. under half of it? Yeah, but so, I, it's, so I just, can't remember if it's a two year or three year amount you have. It's, we, we, my understanding is, as, is, is it's the first year of the award. So that represents two years. We got it in 1920 and in 2021, correct? Okay. So the 2021, the, the money we just received, we're okay on that for probably another year. The money we received in 1920, which like as Lois said, represents probably under half of that is the money that we have our eye on to make sure that we spend down by another amount. Okay, of all of those, all of the carryovers, are there others that need to be spent or sent back? Not that I'm aware of, of these programs. So no, there I in the COVID resource, there was a 70, it's, it was a state one. I want to say we had north of a quarter million dollars on that, and it did expire in June at the end of maybe May or something. I want to say we sent back 25,000 or so of that. But of all the millions and millions, I think that's the only part that we've sent back up is like twenty five or twenty six thousand um, dollars. We spent what's not up there is uh, resource thirty two twenty. That was that big two point six million dollar one that we had to spend by December. We got that all spent down. They extended it to May. We were able to spend that down to, to nothing. Um, there, the, out of everything that I'm aware of, the only one that we sent back was a was a fraction, like like I said, twenty five twenty six thousand of a state uh, COVID resource. The other uh, restricted programs that are not listed on here are, are what are called fund balance programs. So that carryover doesn't necessarily expire. It just sits in the balance until we kind of get to it. The programs that I've listed up here, their carryover has, has in most cases expiration. So that's why I just wanted to make sure that we're aware of these because these are the ones that we definitely want to watch. The other resources that are not listed on here, but may be on the cap form in the report, um, don't necessarily expire the same way. So we can just sit on that. <coughs> Any other I questions? I think that uh, it's important that our, especially our principals uh, and other administrators and even teachers know that we have so many dollars that are available that are considered carryover that could be utilized to meet some of the needs out in the schools, um, but I don't know what they are, but they do. Right. And, um, but rather than you know keeping in your office and, and on, on paper, uh, let them know that we do have money for those crazy projects that mm -hmm. they don't think they will get funded, but might, might get funded. Right. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
The district is to be commended for adding universal transitional kindergarten, eliminating combination classes, and expanding elective opportunities to increase engagement. You know, I, I'm glad to hear that from the county because we've been working for that on this for a long time, and somebody has finally recognized that our accomplishment, and, and I, I really appreciate all the work that the board and the staff have done, to, and of course everybody out in the field, that we have at least we know that we have accomplished some of this. Uh, just to acknowledge that the feedback that I'm getting, the, the kids are really happy to be back, uh, along with their classmates, back in, in class. I'm glad that was the report. Superintendent's report. Um, I would like to report that the second workshop with Patrick Sinclair uh, is scheduled for our next school board meeting um, on September 21st at 4 p.m and it's prior to the regularly scheduled board meeting. And that is a, a completion of his workshop with the uh, um, trustees. In addition, um, as a reminder, the Bow Clinic will be held on this Saturday uh, from 12 to 2 o'clock, and this is an opportunity for um, the community to have access to another round of um, COVID vaccines as well as um, school athletics, um, sport physicals, uh, and the required um, school immunizations. Thank you. Superintendent, this is Bob Day Report. Good evening again. Um, I'm gonna kind of expand a little bit on, on uh, Sunny's topic and just wanna share with the, uh, the board and the community the uh, outcome or the results from the 2021 health cap and adopted budget. Um, we presented that here to the board back in June, obviously submitted that to the county, and then about a week or so ago, we received the letter from um, the county of Riverside. They have approved our budget, and um, there's just some notes to kind of highlight. So with respect to their um, analysis of the LCAP. Um, what they look to see is if the plan adheres to the template that adopt that was uh, distributed by the State Board of Education, which it did. The plan has sufficient expenditures to implement the strategies and actions in the plan, uh, which it did. And then the plan adheres to the expenditure and requirements for the funds apportioned on the basis of the number and concentration of unduplicated pupils, which it did. Uh, based on the county's analysis, um, the LCAP was approved, so that was good news for us. Um, they also commented on, as Sunny stated, our progress with respect to success in ELA and mathematics, uh, commending the district for our efforts and achievement in closing those gaps, so that was also good news for the district. Um, they also commend us for uh, providing increased course access um, and student enrollment in rigorous coursework and CTE pathways. Um, we had a 19.7 increase, percent increase, excuse me, on that readiness, or excuse me, yeah, a 19.7% increase on the college and career readiness indicators. So also great news for the district. With respect to pupil engagement and school climate, uh, the county states that the district is be, to be committed for adding the universal TK, as Sunny stated, um, and increasing the elective opportunities for our students. And then finally, with respect to the, the budget uh, portion of what we submitted to the county, uh, they did approve our budget. Uh, they wanna highlight the following uh, items, that enrollment and, and ADA continues to decline. Um, so it's important for us to monitor our enrollment in the current and out years to make sure that we are uh, planning for the appropriate revenues and, then, and, uh, and any associated actions that come with that. Um, reminding us that the COLA in the first year is 5.07, but we reduced down to 2.48. Uh, next year is what's projected being 3.11% in the last year. Um, and again, just more of a warning for us just to keep an eye on those numbers and how they change the financials and making sure we're adjusting our budget plans accordingly. Um, 
For the moment, we are not engaged in unrestricted deficit spending. Uh, currently, the district's projections do not indicate um, any deficit spending through the 23-24 school year. And again, a lot of that is just due to being propped up by all of the stimulus funding. Um, employee negotiations, uh, we're continuing with uh, both classified and the teachers this year. Um, and so that will, of course, change our financial picture depending on what the outcome of these negotiations look like. And then lastly, their final, well, not lastly, the next uh, comment on the letter is our reserve for economic uncertainties. Uh, we have met our 3% requirement and we will continue to do so in all of the budget out years. Uh, so we're good there. Cash management, we appear to be good there. We pro project to have sufficient cash to cover uh, the next uh, either 18 months or two years, I think we submitted to them. Um, they're reminding us that we have a lot of one-time funding uh, propping us up. So we wanna make sure that we're considering those one-time funds and how they fit into uh, our long-term strategies and goals. And uh, the conclusion is that our COEs, they say that our office commends the district for its efforts thus far to preserve its fiscal solvency and maintain a, qu a high quality uh, education program for its students. So all in all, pretty good letter from the county. And that is how it Any questions?
at 6.42. Action items, 01, approval of resolution number 2021-BC-15. Appropriations due to the reconciliation of the 2020-2021 estimated Indian fund balances and the 2020-2021 unaudited actual Indian fund balances and the 2021-22 beginning fund balances. Call for a motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 02, approval of resolution number 2021-22-12, adopting GAM limit calculations. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 03, approval Head Start Second 2020-2021 Budget Revision. Call for motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 04, approval agreement for information system support services. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 05, approval of variable term waiver. EC 44252B and T580021.1. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 06, approval of variable term waiver, EC 44252B and T580021.1. Call for motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 07, approval memorandum of understanding between Calvert Unified School District and CSEA dated September 1st, 2021. Call for a motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 08, approval of new position, one sign language interpreter. Call for a motion. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 09, approval of resolution number 202122-13, instructional material sufficiency. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 010, approval and adoption of supplemental K-8 math curriculum. So moved. Call for a second. Second. Questions or comments? Uh, I'm glad to see that this is a supplemental not the not the basic um, I'm not a big on common core um, so with that I'll call for the vote all right all in favor Aye. Aye. any opposed 011 approval quote fuel education for additional student licenses so moved second questions or comments all in favor desktop computers no. uh, targeting the systems that currently do not or cannot run Windows 10 uh, in our district. Okay. Good. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 